Hey, good evening, Dr. Dr. Gyu. That's the correct pronunciation, right? Yes, sir. Good evening. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. So, Dr. Luis Gyu Suarez, very excited to talk to you. Um, I read through your thesis summary. For those that don't know, it was Brevarium on Corruption. Um, just for the audience that are going to watch this, could you give a brief introduction of yourself and your experience, as well as just a brief introduction to what your thesis was about? Because I think it was very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, I have a PhD in law uh, from a Spanish university uh, regarding international law and Spanish law. I am a Colombian. I also have a master's in national security and defense. And I studied uh, a, a master's in marketing, and I also studied electrical engineering as my undergrad degree. I worked as an engineer in the oil industry. Then um, I did, uh, started a translating firm from Spanish to English, and we do other languages. And from that, I decided to pursue part of the studies. The reason why I studied uh, corruption in terms of law is because I had a when I was studying the masters, uh, we did root cause analysis of problems to guarantee national security and preserving the way of life, which is what really national security is all about, preserving your way of life from your every respective culture. And there, one of the root causes of just about everything that went wrong in our country was corruption. Corruption was sort of at the root of just about everything that had gone wrong. That's why I thought it was an interesting topic to go ahead and study it. And that's what I did. Obviously, I graduated as an undergrad in class of 1984. And well, you can sum up the years. Just don't mention how young I am. <laughs> I wouldn't. Uh, so it, it's funny because it seems as though we are going through something very similar in Trinidad and Tobago. Well, I say it seems because I don't really have data on this except for public perception. I actually did... Uh, brief survey. Uh, this last week got about 130 respondents. I'll send you the link to that just now so we could go through while we're talking about your thesis. Uh, but let's just dive right into it. So I know I gave you some questions. So you could just run through the answers, maybe expound on it a little bit more so the viewers out there could get a, an idea of what we're talking about. So the first one was, uh, first of all, how you define corruption. And you defined it, uh, which I liked, as... Um, Corruption is seeking personal or private interests at the expense of common well-being. So what exactly is common well-being and how do we define it? Well, yes, corruption is exactly that. You're seeking your personal interests at the expense of something else, and that something else is common well-being. Common well-being is something that you have to, uh, with a community, you have to decide on what is actually common. So it's very easy to know um, in... Um, when you have two persons that are very similar, for example, two soccer fans who happen to both be males, or no, let me use a better example, two soccer fans who happen to be females, they have a lot in common. But as soon as you bring someone who likes volleyball, although they're all sports people, then they don't have that much in common. And so you, you begin to reduce what is actually common. That which you, when everybody gets a say on it, and what they agree upon, that is actually what the common well-being is all about. To that community and it's subjective it's subjective to that community and as soon as you change the community it slightly changes so each community has a slightly different taxative definition of what common well-being really is to them i hope i answered that so properly <laughs> yeah you answered pretty well but now i'm wondering how do you go about Defining a common well-being for a society, you know, of a million people or 10 million or 20 million people, that definitely wouldn't, doesn't seem like an easy task to do. Well, it's just like eating an elephant. You just take one bite at a time. That would be the first one. And it's not really trying to be funny, but you can actually have uh, communities that identify with themselves that as you grow the communities, they can speak. The, the important thing here, uh, I, I'll give you an example. Usually when you have a, a, a condo, there is a lot of people in the condo and when you have those yearly meetings in the condo, there's just screaming and going on and fighting here and one trying to impose his will over there and so on. But there are means to actually get it in those big communities. You start with relatively 
communities that not are small, but that they really do identify themselves with what is tr truly common to them. And in those communities, you can do it as long as you do not defend your ideas with um, the, the, the virtues of the argument. Or why they right, not arguing based on merit, not arguing based on merit, because although this might seem silly, um, arguing anything on merit at the bottom of the merit agreement is my argument is better than your argument just because it's mine. And if I say that, and after that, Ali, you say that, then someone else says that our vanities are going to clash and it's impossible just like you say in a community of a million people to actually reach an agreement on the other hand if we were to have a community where you have a right to sit at the table and have a vote just because you paid your way to that seat and because you are a member of our community so you have those things you're a good you're a member of our community in good standing and at the same time you paid your dues to sit at the table to opine then all we have to do is you give your idea, I give my idea, he gives his idea, she gives her idea, and so we go along. And then in this process of listening to one another, you explain my idea, the person next to you explains your idea, and so we go on just to guarantee that we all understood each other's idea. And once we understand everybody's idea, now we have a vote. Yes, definitely, it's absolutely democratic. But we have a vote not on whose idea is best so it should go first, but rather whose idea should go first so that the other's idea are complemented and bettered. For example, if someone wants to say that they want to have a Spanish-style roofing, and then someone w wants to say that they want to have big open windows, it's obviously that we should do the windowing before we do the roofing. So is it a vote on the chronology will allow you to have one million people actually reach in agreement of what is common. I warn you though, what one million people have in common is not a lot. It's actually four, five, as many fingers as you have in your hand is about as many things that they do have in common. Right, and you're also saying that is, that is part of the aim. You want to make the focus of the well-being as small as possible because you know you don't want to end up in a situation where you're spending taxes on frivolous things, things that the majority of the country is not going to benefit from. Correct. So, for example, let me give you an example that is food for thought. Suppose you want to take a man to the moon. Now, when uh, the Russians were first in space, that generated a lot of technological progress. And then when the Americans decided to land actually on the moon, that generated a lot of progress. Now the question is, should that be paid with taxpayer money or should that be paid with private enterprise money? Well, if everybody's going to go to the moon, then it can be paid with taxpayer money. Or if all the progress that you find from the benefits of going to the moon, meaning all the patents that you get to go to the moon, if they're going to be everybody else's pattern or everybody's going to get a return some money because they paid their taxes and they're going to get some percentage participation on all the exploitation of those technologies, then it should be paid with taxpayer money. Otherwise, it's only something for the scientists, for the scientists, very, very useful, very admirable, you know, something that is just a, a sort of a landmark in history. Yes, yes, yes. But who's going to pay for that? And no, it should not be taxpayer money. Hmm. So this would be... I guess a good idea would to have something like a Ministry of Technology that will handle the research, the funding, as well as, as well as own the intellectual property and make profit from licensing that intellectual property afterwards. Uh, to give an example, if we on the case of, um, of astronomy, let's say whoever developed all the scientific discoveries that went into making a satellite. Now, satellites are something used around the world. And if, let's say, the government of Colombia invented everything to build an entire satellite, and now you have these satellites being used around the world, and every country in the world has to pay these royalties. The royalties should go back into Colombia's public purse. That's what they say. And so it will generate revenue for the country, and then that revenue could be used uh, to increase the level of living in that country as well. 
So yes, exactly what I'm saying. So I am not saying that we should not pay use taxpayer monies to develop a satellite. You can do that, but if you do do that, then the royalties cannot go to private companies. The royalties has to go back to that public purse. That's what I'm arguing. Right, so then it's less of a, a tax that you're paying and more of like a tax investment because you're taking my money to invest it in something that you would use to bring back more income for our collective good, for now all of us to profit from it. So that is one of the aims you're trying to get to. Yes, but uh, there is one caveat to that. Uh, whenever you do basic research, you don't always know where you're going. And sometimes, I wouldn't say that the money is wasted. I do back uh, basic research all the time. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily um, give yield a result. Sometimes we just learn by making a mistakes and, and sometimes we cannot conclude. We're still in the process of trial and error. So, so in basic research, there's a lot of trial and error. Nonetheless, usually all that basic research is for the good of mankind. So the only thing that we can do to make it right is who profits from all those progresses. If it's only one person, a private person, as opposed to the common good, there's something wrong with that. Yeah, I think an example of that would be in the states where you have a lot of uh, public st publicly funded studies go into developing new drugs and the new drugs are actually developed by the drug companies, but then the drug companies will patent the drug and they will sell it at a profit and they will profit off of it, although the bulk of the research was paid for by taxpayers' dollars. So I guess that would be a case where the, the system was corrupted a bit. I fully agree. Yes, I would define it like that. And the only thing that you have to do is correct the last, last bit. Don't let the patent go to the private company. Let the patent go to the people who funded that basic research. That's the only thing you need to correct. Because we do need new drugs, we do need research, yes, but don't give the patent to a private person at the end. I know there's a common misconception. When we talk about corruption, people automatically think kickbacks being paid to government officials. Although, I see you define that as petty corruption, which is basically one of the um, least prevalent forms of corruption. And there are actually three other types of corruption you touched on, which was private, public, and structural. So, uh, and these were defined by the Asian Development Bank, you said? Yes, these are, these are taken from the Asian Development Bank. You can query them on their web page. And you did mention petty corruption. Now, petty corruption is when you actually pay a tiny sum of money. The example that you mentioned, there could be a public official who actually takes a considerable cut and that considerable cut can no longer be uh, called petty. Odebrecht is a, is a fantastic example of an engineering company and everything that was associated with them, nothing about them was petty. When I mention petty, I mean the guard at a gate who for a dollar opens the door. Um, I mean the, someone who when you need to have a doctor's appointment, you slip a $20 bill here and they skip you on the line. That is referred to as petty corruption. And that one seems, uh, I hope you don't find this offensive, but we kind of smile at those things because it happens just about everywhere and we think it's funny, but really it isn't funny because if you're paying $1 to open one, do one door here, $20 here, $10 are there, $5 here, after a day of just doing running errands, you're, you're $1,000 short and you are one citizen and if there are a million citizens, then uh, it's no longer... Uh, so funny although on each yeah. transactional basis it gets to be funny that's petty now let's go to private corruption private corruption is the most uh, the one that has the most impetus it has the greatest drive these are company owners who are trying to turn a profit have some contacts and they come to their friends and say hey we went to school together you know me i know you you are in a good position now if you run things my way I'll make sure I'll take care of you. That is the most prevalent form of, of, of corruption that you have, and it's very, very uh, perverse, although it's not the most perverse. But if you notice, is that private entrepreneurship that is misunderstood and driven the wrong way, but that one is a very strong one. Then you have a second form of corruption, which is structural corruption, and this one is probably the most perverse of them all because it's headless. You just change the rules of the game so that 
every so that the pipeline sort of drains into my yard and I get to irrigate oh, my farm. Oh, okay. That's how you get that's what structural corruption is. But whenever you see the law, you don't quite understand how it's working, but someone in the end benefits. I'll give you a, a very, very old that example. That would be like um so that would be similar to what I would guess a lot of lobbyists do in the US as well, where they would lobby for certain restrictions to be placed, like um, Comcast not allowing competition in certain states so that they could have a monopoly in certain areas. And then other companies, um, well, I guess uh, other companies colluding with them, price fixing and stuff, that would be a different kind of corruption. But this one where they would, they would have, you know, rules set up in law so that you need a certain kind of license to... Okay, let me, let me begin again. So let's say I'm a company... And I have, a, I have a big enough company that I could get some sort of political influence. So now I get some laws passed to make, it, to make it so that you need a license to now practice what I'm practicing. Let's say, um, let's say it's like Russia, where Russia, they have, I think, um, only certain companies are allowed to produce vodka. They still like vodka in Russia. And to get a license is almost impossible. So as a... As somebody that has all the money and all the capital and expertise, I can't just jump out. I can't just make my own vodka production factory because I don't have this license and this license is only given out by the state. And the state will only give it out to, I guess, their friends or their business partners. So in such a way, you have something set up in law um, that will let the people that produce that vodka uh, be the only ones that could produce it. And anyone else, they sort of use the law to constrict the market to themselves. So that would be a case of structural corruption. That would be a case of structural corruption. But let me give you one simpler down to earth. We have, we all have cars and, and after they're three, four years old, we should have a mechanical checkup on those cars to make sure that they're safe to, 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 to be using the road, that they're roadworthy. But in the roadworthiness test, we have to check that each four brakes stop from 60 kilometers an hour or 60 miles an hour to zero in three seconds and there can be no phase difference between your left wheel and your right wheel. And that is checked with a machine called XK331. And we just give the yield of what that machine does to measure how well your car brakes. And it turns out that only my cousin in the country has that machine. And we put those in the specs and everybody has to go check up their car. And to have their mechanical checkup, that's a perfect example of structural corruption. And when I'm, now, if it's my cousin, but suppose it's my uh, cousin's uh, brother in law or something like that, you just don't know the tie. And you figure that that guy is really certifying roadworthiness, and actually he is. But by allowing only one machine to control that, because that's what the specification says. And you put all these specifications in generic terms. Turns out that the only machine that actually complies with that is that one. That's a, a more common example because we don't manufacture vodka, although your example was brilliant. We don't manufacture... Uh, <laughs> That's actually what happened in um, Russia. I can imagine. And we have examples like that mm. left and right. I think something that happens commonly in Trinidad and Tobago is that you have some ministers might buy a property and then rent it back to the state. And the amount of money they'd rent it to the state for, the state could easily use that same money and build a, a permanent building and not have to pay any rent and end up with, you know, a permanent asset that they could use indefinitely. Uh, so what kind of corruption would that be? That's public corruption because it's a public official who is mm -hmm. ruining the well-being of the tax money channeling it to his rental property and even if even if that is perfectly legal um and there isn't any rules against let's say like a conflict of interest that would still be considered corrupt because of how it affects the well-being of the people absolutely but the thing of being legal we have to be careful with laws because there's some laws all laws are legal but not all laws are moral i can remember a time where it was lawful to put black people at the back of the bus. That's not morally right. That's morally wrong. And I can remember laws where only the British Empire can deal opium. 
And I can remember laws where only the British Empire can mine salt in the coasts of India because extracting salt from the sea was Her, Her Majesty's business. That was the law. It wasn't more. And like that we have other laws. Uh, gradually people refine themselves. I gave you examples of 100 and 200 years ago and that's a bit unfair. We should be more recent. But there were laws at that time. Well, the, the one about riding in the back of the bus is not that old. It was in the 1960s. That's not right. Yeah, just, just three years, 60 years ago. Yeah. And if we go to other latitudes in Africa, I can remember countries in Africa that were 20 years ago where you couldn't ride. You had to always walk on the sunny side of the street. And that was the law. But it's not morally right. So anything that is legal, especially when they're structurally corrupt laws that have been passed, the fact that they're legal doesn't make them right. All right. So you could have, well, the corrupt laws. And that's what structural corruption is. That's what structural corruption is. And they're usually passed by very educated and sophisticated people. So they're not easily to detect. And they don't have a trail. And it's not easy to find out who is the head of all of this? It's actually a headless form of corruption. That's why it is so, so, so heinous. So then, I guess regressive taxes would also fall under structural corruption. Absolutely. And let me clarify what regressive taxes are. Progressive taxes mean the one who has the most pays the most. The, the one who's stronger, strongest carries the most weight. And that sounds quite logical to most of us. Regressive taxes, on the other hand, which is the uh, uh, structural corruption example that you cited, it means that the weakest carry the greatest burden. The poorest end up paying, in practice, the most. And that is common, for example, with sales tax. Sales tax is a regressive tax. And there are many regressive taxes. The reason why they're there is because they help finance the national bursts. I understand their capacity to uh, have revenues, but if you were to be at least have decently, uh, sort of uh, reasonably uh, decent, you should have less than 50% of the taxes should be regressive, not more. I can assure you in my country, more than 85, 84% of the taxes are regressive. I'm not sure of the exact percentage for Trinidad and Tobago, but um, I think it's definitely more than 51, more than 51%. Now, we had a, a new tax that was implemented just a couple of years ago called an online purchase tax. And basically, this is a 7% tax on any purchase that was made online. And I think this is only applied to air shipments, which is what most common people do. Right? When I order something from Amazon, I'm not going to ship it by sea because that takes longer. And that is only economical if I'm shipping large bulk shipments, which most people don't do. So what, you ended, up, um, what ended up happening was that the majority of ordinary people that purchase stuff online would be paying an extra 7% tax just for, buying something, um, just for buying something online from a different country. And we produce very little down here. So almost everything we have to buy from online and import. But for bigger businesses that bring in larger shipments by sea freight, they didn't have this tax applied to them. So that was like another form of regressive tax that was applied to us, I think just about two or three years ago, that came out. Beautiful example. So the big guys don't get to pay it, and the little guys have to pay everything. Yes. Yeah. That happened. And I think you've seen the law of this is that it's a lot harder to charge a few rich people than it is to charge a massive, like the massive middle class and working class. Because if you raise, if you raise the, the taxes by 50% on 1 million people, you know, it's a much bigger profit than if you raise the taxes by $10,000 on five um, richer people. So that's why the regressive taxes are, are so, um, so alluring to try to to try to get money for the public purse because it's easier just to take a little bit from a lot more people to get a lot more in exchange for it. That is the essence of the argument. Another additional one is that whenever you have a government who has a tax rate of 
uh, in a, a progressive system, meaning that the ones who have the most pay the most, suppose they want to increase their revenues twofold. The only way that they can increase their revenues in their government twofold is to guarantee that their rich, the rich group that is paying the most in a progressive system will, will have to double their patrimony before you can tax them. So, for example, if in 2020 you have 10 rich people who have over 10 billion each and you need to double your revenues and you are actually taking 10%, you have to wait for them to, in 2020 to double their wealth and you would have to tax them in 2021 after they have doubled their wealth, which is not an easy affair to do. On the other hand, if you just want to double your revenues, charge everybody a dollar and then you can double your revenues. That's why governments like so much regressive taxes, but they're profoundly unfair. They're actually structurally corrupt. But you still have to sort of to a fine line because you don't want you don't want to discourage people from doing well. So the idea isn't to bring down the ceiling on the rich, but to lift up the the working class and the middle class to reduce that to reduce that um, income inequality. And I think you were saying um, an income inequality of ten times is is where is like the ideal amount. So what you want is it's good that you have rich people. So what you want is to raise the threshold of the poor, like raise the poverty line, so that the rich can be 10 times as rich as the poorest poor. So how much of a ceiling is that to the rich? It really isn't much of a ceiling. If you want to have a salary of a million, just guarantee that the one who earns the less at least receives a uh, 100,000. But if you want 10 million as a monthly salary, just make sure that everybody's earning a million. And certain people who are incredibly rich, um, they are exceptional people. But on average, after you have had, I don't know, if you're not very fan of shirts and so on, after you have five, six, seven shirts, you stop wanting to... To, to buy more shirts. Maybe after that you spend your money on trips or on studies or on books or on art or any other thing. So the fact that you raise this threshold on the, on the poor doesn't mean that everybody's going to want to be ultra rich like you have the ultra rich. The only thing you want to regulate is that the threshold is high enough for the rich to have all the wealth that they want. Now, I'm just wondering how this will be balanced with um with the amount you should tax as in so so it's it's a very this sounds like a very complex balancing game then because you want to keep the inequality low, but you also want to keep the the well being as um the common well being as small as possible, and you also want to keep the regressive taxes as low as possible uh Is there any country in the world that is actually meeting these criteria, or what country comes the closest to it? In, the, in, your, in your opinion? Well, there are some examples. The problem with those countries is that they are not very populated. So, for example, you have Singapore. It's a good example of that. You have um, Finland to be a good example of that. You have uh, Canada to be a relatively good example of that, not as good as the other two. And Canada, by the way, has a population uh, smaller than that of Florida, and its economy is smaller than that of Florida. Just to, to, to have a perspective, most people don't know that. By the way, um, uh, California has an economy that is uh, like 1.2 times the Russian economy, just the state of California. Oh. So, so, so most people well, don't, don't, don't know that when, when, when you study these things. So, so the examples that we do have, we have totalitarian governments um, that are sort of democracies. Uh, that is uh, um, Singapore. Singapore is a democracy, a very controlled democracy. Um, then in Finland, you have a different form of democracy, but you have a set of groups of the old boys club, but things work well. Uh, uh, and uh, they have... Um, resources same thing as Norway 
it's, it's another example, but they're not very populated countries. But yes, you can find a good balance. The thing is that you have to realize that first, all men were not created equal. That's absurd. We're all different. Now, what we do have to have is equal opportunity. And if you are 10 times better than me, I envy you in the best of senses because you run faster than me. I mean, Usain Volt, that guy can run. Uh, and he's admirable, and that's why he won so many medals. But he doesn't run 10 times as faster than me. He runs 5, 6, 7, 8 times faster than me, but not 10. When someone starts to run 20 times faster than me, I think somewhere he's cheating. Right. <laughs> so we know that. So we have to allow a window of differences because people are different. And even if you give them equal opportunity, there are going to be differences. So we have to accept that there are always going to be differences. And now we just have to put a ceiling. Is the difference going to be 10 times? Is the difference going to be 11 times? Is it going to be 15 times? I can assure you that by the time it's 20 times, it just is a difficult pill to swallow. That's one. Then, when you have revenues, because you spoke about having all this balance of revenues, when you do have all those revenues, you can have the set of revenues to pay for all the things that are common, as long as that things that are common are not everything, including space research, but rather limited to all those things that the nation really needs to guarantee its cultural survival. And I guess this is where something like tax rebates would probably come in handy as well. Because if I'm, if I'm making 100 times more than my, uh, my employee that's making it less, the least amount is making, right? Then if I don't want to pay 90% of my income into taxes, that should at least encourage me to reinvest in my company, reinvest in the people in my company, uh, maybe do more research, maybe buy more assets and help keep the company stimulated as well. Otherwise... Uh, it'll just sort of discourage somebody from hoarding all the cash because I, I guess, well, in, in my view, I'm not, my view is not educated, but I just think the more hoarding of cash you have is the less liquid the economy and the less liquid the economy um, just means the, the less buying power every ha everybody has because it's less money in circulation. So is something like, is this, is this a way that tax rebates could actually work in the favor of promoting equality? Well, um, Mr. Short, if I'm not mistaken, that's his name, Short. Uh, he was one of those co-founders of uh, Facebook. And he uh, is saying pretty much something like that to guarantee a minimum income to all Americans. Um, and uh, it's funny that you mentioned this example because now that we are in lockdowns for uh, uh, COVID-19, COVID you, you begin to see... In those countries that mishandled the entire uh, pandemia, uh, what they did is they locked down. And by locking down, they shrank the economy by killing the demand. And as soon as they start to reactivate, they're not going to give tax break to the large companies. Large companies do not generate employment. The ones who generate employment is people who have money in hand to spend and then some entrepreneur creates a company to tell them, hey, you have some money to spare? I will serve you in a bar. I will serve you in a restaurant. I will provide communications to you. I will provide entertainment. I will provide education. I will provide travel. I will provide leisure. That's how companies are made. So right now, after the lockdowns, the only way that you're going to be able to... to reactivate the economy is not by giving companies breaks it's by putting money into people's hands so that there is demand from the bottom up yeah i think um senator mitt romney was looking at something like that with the lockdown in the states given all families like one thousand to three thousand dollars so instead of trying to bail out the big banks and bail out the airlines and the companies that are going corrupt um going bankrupt <laughs> not corrupt Correct. And that you're going to see now, right now, with all these lockdowns, they're going to have to do that. And that should be a brilliant lesson in, in how to reactivate economy and why giving tax breaks for the ultra-wealthy do not generate jobs and do not generate a greater economy. They just generate greater profits for them. Now, if you were to have two islands like 
Barbados and Trinidad, and there was one company in Barbados, and you gave them a tax break, and the company moved to Trinidad, where of course you generated jobs for Trinidad. But it's a zero-sum game. The jobs that you generated for Trinidad were subtracted from Barbados. So that didn't create jobs if you want to look at the whole picture. It did create jobs for Trinidad if you want to look at my country first. But that's not a good example of how to manage economy. By the way, fighting corruption, it's really, uh, besides being a moral issue and something that attracts something, it's really an economic policy where if you spend your money, your tax money on what's the common good and infrastructure for the common good, then everybody's better off. And it's actually an economic policy. It's an economic justification why you should not be corrupt. Hmm. But just to touch on one more thing. So what are your views on universal basic income? Have you ever given it any thought? Yes, I think that it should. it, it is a very good idea. But it is a very good idea as long as you do not create dependency. You, ha you cannot ruin people's pride. So if at first for you to start, you need this money, that's fine. Gradually, I should reduce that as you begin to make your own money because it's going to make it more worth it for you. So when you start off, I give you $1,000. As soon as you find out that you can do something, and you earn 500, I can tell you, hey, uh, uh, Halil, would you accept me lowering you to 400 because I see that you are a very capable man and you already are, uh, you know, you're earning 600 on your own. Can I cut you back to 400? You can tell me no, cut me back to 600 so I can have 1200. Fine, I accept that. But gradually, because you feel proud of what you can make and not just handouts. You don't want to make people dependent on handouts. Some politicians like that because that's an easy, easy vote to buy. But no, people are proud people. People feel proud of making their own business. The only thing is I want you to guarantee that at least you eat and at least you have you know, two sets of clothes. You wash one, you wear the other. That's what I want. And I give you to that and as soon as I say, hey, you can pull your own weight, you are going to be the first one who says, I want to get off welfare. And you do not, when you do give basic handouts, the only thing, the key important thing that you have to manage is do not generate dependency. I think that would be another delicate balance to strike as well. Because I know there are some people that as soon as they realize they could get by with doing absolutely nothing. I mean, you will, not everybody, a lot of people will have too much pride for that. But you always have the outliers to consider that will just do anything to not have to work. And as soon as they could get that kind of dependency, they will just try to see how dependent they could come on the state. And I think, yeah, I think that might be something to worry about. Yes, definitely. Uh, there you have to check your social programs. There are many people who are very, very capable in social pro programs. And in those social programs, you do have to uh, make sure you do not generate dependency because dependency is harmful. And people don't like to be dependent, most of them. I know we were talking the other night about another way of defining well-being. You were saying by looking at all the things you would need if there was a war, or I guess in this case, a pandemic, and during peacetime or during a time when you don't have a crisis, building up everything you would need to sustain your country when there is. So I guess that would give us stuff like um, like public health care. Um, uh, I think p pensions was one. Pensions was one that you said was a sort of funny, a funny topic. And I was wondering why was, was pensions so funny? Okay, well, first let's talk about why we pay taxes. We pay taxes to preserve our way of life. That means defense. It means you, someone has to protect why we like uh, uh, crab and kalulu. It might not be something very important, for, but for all those people who like crab and kalulu, there are many grandmas who want their grandchildren to keep on eating crab and kalulu. And roti, the way you buy it uh, uh, out of, uh, you know, out of, after carnival, the way it's wrapped, the way it's cooked, it's not the same as in India. It's a typical Trinidadian food. So when you're going to do something like that, you have to preserve that. You have to preserve calypso. You have to preserve uh, a brass band. You have to preserve all those things that identify your culture. And that means preserving them against a pandemia or preserving them against a military invasion to kill you all. So 
That's why you pay taxes, and that's why you mentioned the cycle of war and peace, because you want to have a short war and a long extended peace. And peace and war are tied in that, in, in that cycle the way light and darkness are tied. The only way you can appreciate light is if there's darkness. So the only way you can appreciate peace is if you've gone or known war. And you want short cycles of war and in peace and long periods or long cycles of peace. And in those peace times, you should build yourself for those defenses. Defenses in medicine, defenses in healthcare, defenses in providing the culture so that one uh, cultural concept is passed on to the other generation. That's what you want to preserve. So there is where you have uh, sort of all these programs that you do in peacetime to be prepared for those crises times. Now let's talk about pensions. Why is pension a funny thing? Well, it turns out that pensions were an idea that were invented by the Germans in, in the, the, the First Reich, not the Third, the First Reich, which is the 1890s around there. But the Germans at the time didn't have money to actually finance these things, so the Americans copied it, and they were the first who invented pensions. The curious thing about it is that at that time, you could pension yourself at 55 when life expectancy, on average, was 50 years. So it was conceived for, on average, for dead people. Now, mind you, on average, what I mean, for you to have an average of 50 years of lifespan, it means that some people lived until they were 60, and some people died when they were 40, so that the average right. could hit 50. But then when you decided everybody should pay, so that we can provide for the elderly in their golden years. The funny thing is that their golden years have to start at 55, where most were dead. And the curious thing at the time was that most of these parents had six and seven children. So you had six and seven children paying their pensions for their dad as long as their dad had a above average life in terms of years. Because on most parents, would have died by 50 and they put the pension age by 55 then came advances in medicine that extended life expectancy and of course the system began to have problems in financing because it was already conceived to only provide pensions for those for the average that survived that were above average life expectancy to boot people started having less kids by now the system is shot to pieces it cannot be financed as is. And the only reason why they do it, I would speculate, is because in pensions you have this big pot of money, and when it's full like that, somebody wants to snatch it. I think Japan has uh, an aging population right now, and I think they are having a, a massive problem with funding their pension. So I think that is a, a country that they have that problem. And then... Well, I guess the U.S. again, I think the only reason I bring up the U.S. is because so much of their financial problems are so well documented um, in the news media. But I know that when you look at uh, the pandemic, like this pandemic, and all of the um, the drop in the, the stock market right now, I think the stock market dropped by about 33%. Now, a lot of this money would have been in pension funds. And my question is, well, where did the money go? Or if you look at the 2008 financial crisis, where the investors, um, through some tricks of marketing, of, of grouping subprime loans with actual uh, prime loans, they were able to get people to, I guess, buy into loans that they weren't going to pay. And then they took pension funds and invested in these loans. Um, I think I'm getting some of this wrong. But basically, it was a way for people to get their hands on the money that was in the pension funds, as well as get their hands on money that people pay in mortgages. So it's like they were dipping in both pockets at the same time. So I think that's, that's kind of what you're trying to say, where they want to have this massive pension fund as a way to dip into it in the future. Well, no, pension funds, because everybody is, 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 is pitching in, it, it's hard cash that you have there. In the banking system, there, there's something great about being a banker, uh, because you create wealth out of non-use. 
Let me explain that. Um, when when you start a bank, everybody deposits their money. So you deposit hundred dollars, I deposit hundred dollars, and a hundred people deposit a hundred dollars. So we have a million dollars. Great. Now these guys realize that they have a million dollars and they literally have them in the bank. Let's say that we deposit it in gold. So they literally have them at the bank. But then they realize that with about 10% of the money, they can pay all the transactions that we, the 100 people who deposit their money in there, um, need. So that's why we have checks. And I sign a check to you, and someone signs a check to me, and so on. But the money never actually moves. Of all those $1 million that they had in gold over there, only 100,000 moves. The other 900,000 stays put. So you say, hey, that's interesting. So if I have a hundred, I can lend 900,000 that I do not really have. So what they end up doing is they break up this million into 10 sets of a hundred. For us who deposit the money, they keep the hundred because that's what experience has shown that we can use. And then they take the second 100 and then they lend 900,000 to other people. And then take this, the other, this, the, third, the third 100 and they lend 900 to other people. By this time you multiply, it's like, whoa, these guys have 1 million and they are uh, lending out 9 million. Because this is risky, oh, okay. because this is risky, the central bank says, no, you cannot do that. You can save 200,000. You can move 100,000 and take the other 800,000 and lend them out. And they can multiply that. Now they make a lot of wealth with that money that really doesn't exist as long as you trust the bank. That's why when you have the panic and everybody says, give me my money, as soon as you take the money out, if you were to pay back all the people with the 100,000, with which money are you, are you backing the 800,000 that you lent to the other people? It is actually oh. backed by the reliance. That's what they do in the banking sector. And that's why you have a crime that's called financial panic. Because when you create financial panic, everybody says, give me my money back. And then all that cloud money, so to speak, vanishes. They did a lot of transactions with that and backed it with a bunch of housing loans and so on. There is a curious example because in Iceland, they suffered like no one did in the world. And there was a bank run only by women. And that was the only bank that did not fall into the financial crisis. They were decent women. My uh, greetings and my congratulations to women who are in your audience. My congratulations to them as well. Um, okay, so, well, I have, I have a couple things here that, um, well, I did a survey uh, just to get people's ideas on corruption in the country. And... We could go through some of the responses. Actually, I could send you the message on Skype, so you could have access to results to the results of the survey as well. Pretty interesting. Uh, but before we get into that, just to give them some background, so you are also seeing that there's 17 pointers to corruption. Uh, I could read through them here, just so people have an idea. One was a source of wealth into which the country could tap into. I guess in our case, that would be oil. Um, one would be having a numerous population under a single political system. I think most countries in the world fall under that, uh, where there's now a system of periodic alternation of ruling executive, whether there is a, or not a system of periodic alternation of the ruling executive. Well, yeah, I guess we have that as well. Um, that the incumbent ruler is closing the gap between the haves and have-nots to the maximum factor of 10, I, I don't think we experienced that in Trinidad, having a taxing system that is mostly progressive. Again, I don't think we have that here, or I guess in Colombia. Um, extractive policies as opposed to inclusive ones. So what is this one about, the extractive policies? Well, there is a gentleman called uh, uh, Simon Glu, and I forget his uh, partner. There are two authors. The book is called why do nations fail? And his name is Asimoglu. I'm pretty sure it's Asimoglu. I'm, I'm, you're, you're, 
I, I have to check because you're playing with my memory about the two names, but I know there are two authors, and I know that the book is called Why Nations Fail. And in some nations, extractive nations, you force everybody to put money in a pot, and then I come in and take that pot. That's what the economy is like. And in other ones, we put money into a pot, and we use that pot to finance a lot of other things that are good to the rest of us. That's what an inclusive society does, and an extractive society is the one that forces everybody to put into one pot, and then I steal the pot. Okay? Um, so that's basically what the book talks about, and, and uh, it mentions, for example, why Botswana in Africa is a successful country, and why other countries uh, in Africa are not successful. So it has to do with being extractive and, and not extractive. You also mentioned that um, if you have an alternating system of power, so if you have a country that does not have an alternating system of power, then it probably is going down a corrupt path. You also mentioned uh, something about not, having, uh, not measuring the gap as whether you're reducing. What I'm saying there is, if you do not reduce the gap between rich and poor while you are ruling in, during your term, you are corrupt. You're not corrupt because you stole, but you're corrupt because you didn't do anything to, to improve the system. If you have a taxing system that is relatively regressive, you are structurally corrupt in your taxing system. So you end up seeing all these scores, and the more you score on these things, then you know eh, it's a really corrupt country. So, so people like to compete and say, my country is more corrupt than yours. You have seen, you haven't seen nothing yet. Let me show you how we did it over here. But just to give you an idea, find the most populous country in the world, find the richest country in the world, find the country that does not rotate its leaders, find the country that has regressive taxes, find the country that doesn't care about reducing the gap between the haves and the have-nots, and wherever all these five things cross, now you're beginning to find out which one could be the most corrupt country in the world. So it doesn't even have to be on purpose. It could just be uh, corruption by incompetence, just by not belonging or not being qualified for, to hold that position. Ah, but wait, 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 wait. How does an incompetent person get there? Someone puts him there and someone is benefiting from that incompetence. The thing is that you don't know what is his or her name. That's all. But they don't get there by luck and chance. Right. And another curious case, what if, what if you have an alternating system, but the system... So again, this is more specific to Trinidad, where we have two main political parties. And right now it seems to be alternating back and forth between the two. But there's a lot to suggest that the two political parties actually work together in some cases. So, for example, we've had, when one political party was in power, they would have done, um, okay, so we had the, the PNM party. They were in power between 2000 to 2010. Now, they did some very, very good extensive reports on corruption in the construction industry. All right? And then when the other party came into power in 2010, these reports, which had enough information, I guess, to start lawsuits against people from their political opponents, these reports just disappeared. So what they have happening is that they will always accuse each other of corruption and corrupt practices, but they will never really investigate each other and they will never really hold each other accountable. But yet, regardless of who is in power, they all seem to be benefiting. So would that count as an uh, alternating system, or would that still be able to... Could you count that as a single political system? Uh, that is an alternating system, and it is a structurally corrupt alternating system. And, and what happens is that things correct themselves um, sort of naturally. You, you have a, a neighbor who can teach you historically what happened. There were two political parties, AD, AD and Copei in Venezuela and they alternated between each other for God knows how long uh, pretty much from the last dictatorship until the recent left socialist uh, dictatorship that they have now 
and they rotated between themselves and they kept this club going for their elites doing preposterous things up until some populist that used to speak beautifully and, and say, you know, the devil has just been here in this, this location and I can still smell the sulfur. Really cute guy who shattered the economy and who just generated poverty in one of the oil richest nations of the world. So if you keep on doing that for too long, some populist is going to come up and probably if he's good, you'll have a great country and a great change. And if he's bad, like your neighbor is awful, he's going to destroy the country to levels of poverty that you can just never imagine. So that's what's going to happen and, and, and I'm not and I'm not being, you know, a prophet of disaster, but just saying that's exactly what happened there. If you abuse it too much, some populist is going to get to to power. That's uh, that's the way it's going to be. So, so it's actually so for those people who love Trinidad, they're the ones who should step up to the plate in decency and say, hey, these two guys are just getting out of hand. <laughs> I think uh, right now a lot of people are starting to do that. I think for this upcoming elections, which was supposed to be this year, well, with the COVID-19, I'm not sure if that will still happen. But we've had more political parties coming out this year than ever before. And I think it's just a, a common feeling. Everybody's just more or less fed up of the back and forth. And we just seem sort of hopeless under the, the current the current back and forth between the two parties. So did you get the, did you, could you check your Skype, your Skype messages? Did you get the link I sent you? So this was just a simple, mm. or a simple survey. How old are you? Yes, I think I got that. Yeah, so just gender, um, citizens. All right, so, well, I had a voting pattern here because we have some, you know, you'll always have some diehard supporters that will always vote for the same party no matter what. And okay. personally, I think I think that's just dangerous and foolish because if I have your vote, then if I know your vote is guaranteed, then I'm not going to do any better because I know I have nothing to do to guarantee your vote. So I will focus my attention on everybody else. And just like that, you basically reduce the value of your vote to nothing. So, but according to this, we have 57% of people say they vote based on the best option, which I think is really good. Um, now, if you scroll down, I have some bar charts here where I just ask some simple questions. Okay. Uh, and again, th which this, one is, this, is this is just perception. This is just people's perception of corruption. So I had, um, ha I had people rate the, their view of the overall performance of our government. I think the average, so the average is 2.7 out of 10. Um, so the average is 2.1 out of these these factors. Uh, overall performance, ease of doing business, diversity in the economy. Now, that's a funny one. We have, we have a, an oil and gas economy. And since I was a child, I've been hearing that they were going to diversify the economy and make our country's economy more stable. And just up to, I think, a couple of days ago, when you had the drop in oil price, I think it's at $25 a barrel now, um, they, they said we're going to go into an economic crisis. So for the past 25 years, they've been talking about diversifying the economy. And for the past 25 years, our entire budget, well, most of our budget has been based on, this, on the price of this one commodity. And again, this is the same back and forth between these same two political parties. So they've both had, so this is 25 years. One would have had, I think, 15 years, and the other party would have had 10 years in that time to try to do something for this one issue, which everybody knew should have been done. And to date, we seem no closer to that goal. I think this is a reason why we probably need term limits as well in this country, because we don't have term limits right now. So again, well, buying power, um, inflation here has been pretty bad. Not as bad as Venezuela. Um, well, decreased public safety. Now, I was reading, I was watching a video by a 
clinical psychologist where he was saying one of the things that drives I think violence and aggression in society is something called the Gini, com the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality in society. Well, on these uh, uh, Gini coefficients, what you want to see is how, how, um, how much unfairness there is, and you measure that. It really depends mm. on, on what you're trying to measure. And you have to look at the Gini coefficients in each one of those um, uh, of those components. Uh, in essence, mm -hmm. Haiti is very uh, unfair. Colombia is very unfair. Brazil is very unfair. Um, mm -hmm. So it gives you a set of pointers. It's not ideal, but it does provide a, a certain level. And, and I am suggesting that that's really what it's showing is just how structurally corrupt the, the system is where you have to, to try to compensate, uh, meaning you have to, to, to lower the gap between the, the, the haves and the have-nots. That's what I'm right. saying. I think something that we need to focus on is what can we do to, as, as individuals to continue battling corruption and what things should we try to set up? I'm, I'm thinking, um, I saw in your thesis, you're talking about having a strong judicial system that is independent on, um, that is completely independent of the, the legislative branch of the government so that they aren't influenced by it. Uh, what else could we do? Well, Halil, I'm really very grateful for your question, but I, I'm a bit confused on, on the term we, because there are many we's. For example, if we were to be teachers, one of the things that we have to teach school children to find corruption is this mechanism to listen to one another, to explain your neighbor's point of view, and to um, vote chronology or chronologically whose ideas in the group should go first and whose ideas should be serviced last and making sure that all ideas are serviced so that we are inclusive and that way we participate as true democrats in a society that actually works. That's one set of we because that would help us and teach us how to define, for example, the common well-being. Teachers can teach us that. Teachers can teach us also um, how the judicial system works, why do we have it, and who should have the burden of proof. Those things can also be taught in schools. Okay, so that, that's about sort of the teachings of what we can do if we were to be school children or if we were to be pedagogues. Fine. But in your question, you say, what should we do? Suppose we are businessmen. What should we do? Well, we should try and have oligopolies and we should try and have self-regulation on oligopolies. So the leader of the oligopoly of the airline should sit with the, legal, the leader of the oligopoly in uh, the transport and fuel industry who should be with the leader in the oligopoly in the transporting of food who should be, uh, sit down at the table and negotiate with the leader of the oligopoly in medicine and uh, with the leaders of the oligopoly in schools. So we should have oligopolies because the best economy that you can have is economy with oligopolies and we should have a mechanisms to allow disruptors to come in. Both things should be guaranteed and there should be a state institution of people who regulate effectively oligopolies, protect customers and allow disruptors to come in. Right, so you'll need to focus on anti-monopoly laws and bodies. Correct, but we need to strive to have oligopolies. Let me, let me explain for your audience what an oligopoly is. Everybody knows what a monopoly is. Well, a monopoly of five players or a monopoly of ten players is an oligopoly. And because it's not one person that controls everything, but there are only five companies or three companies or, or ten companies that control everything, that's an oligopoly. 
So these people should be regulated and they should have antitrust laws, but we need to have them striving. We need for them to progress. We need for them to be wealthy and ever more wealthy every day. That's what we really want in an economy. And we want to have disruptors come into the market so that everybody benefits. And as a last check, we need consumer protection. Whenever I said, hey, I bought a faulty car, give me my money back or give me a new car. And for that system to work, that's what we did. So that's the other we that you asked about. If we were to be health officials, what should we do? And this is an interesting one to speak about now that we're in times of, of the COD uh, vid uh, 19. What should we do with those ones? Well, there are certain responsibilities that we as citizens should all have. And the responsibilities and actions that we as citizens should all have probably do not coincide with the responsibilities and actions that rulers, incumbent governors, prime ministers, presidents have. I don't think that they're the same. So, for example, people should try and stay home. I think that's a good idea. People should definitely wash their hands. People should definitely wash their clothes because this virus apparently, it, it, it's, it's a virus and viruses live in fatty acids, uh, cytoplasmas actually. And if you use soap, actually kills a lot better than it does the sanitizer. So soap is a lot better. All right, that's for citizens, but what should governments do? Well, governments should certainly not copy failed cases. And when I talked about failed cases, um, probably Europe, I don't want to pick one country over another, but probably Europe is an example of everything that you should not do. I can certainly speak comfortably about those countries that are doing things right, like Korea, South Korea, that is. What did they do? They tested. They tested. They tested. The, uh -huh. And they tested a lot. Once they detected a, posit a positive, they went and did biological tracing. So if you are a citizen, you should try and stay home. And you should wash your hands and you should wash your clothes. You should use soap. Yes, you should have social distancing. All that works out great. But if you're a government, you can't be doing that. You can't be ruining the economy the way they have stripped away 40% of the world's wealth in about three weeks. You can't do that. Governments should do testing. That's their responsibility. And governments should do biological tracing. That's their responsibility. And they should preserve the economy. Don't say, you cannot say now that, oh, my country did not grow because of the coronavirus. No, if your economy got halted, it was because of the decisions that you made. Yes, your citizens should have washed their hands. Yes, they should have tried to stay at home. Yes, you should have helped them to stay at home. But it's your responsibility to protect the economy. It's your responsibility to do biological tracing. And it's your responsibility to do testing. If you don't have that, don't put smoke screens and what people should do and how curfews should be and what lockdowns you should have. So once again, going back to your question, who is we? If we can clarify who is we, perhaps I can give you some pointers as to what those sets of people should do. Is there any particular we you were thinking about? Well, the thing is, funny enough, I think you answered my question, which would be everybody just needs to do their part and do their part properly and take responsibility for everything that's under their control and make sure that they are performing their job the way it's supposed to be performed and not underperforming. Thank you very much. I couldn't have said it better. Now, that brings us very nicely into our next point, which was uh, how do you measure corruption? So, because corruption isn't just, isn't just voluntary all the time. Sometimes you have uh, corruption through ineptitude. Um, sometimes you have well the structural corruption. So let's put let's put petty corruption aside for now because petty corruption I think that's the easiest to understand. But for some reason that's what most people think of when they think of corruption, not realizing that you have structural corruption uh, which we went into, um, and the the public corruption and the private corruption. So how exactly do you measure or what are the indicators that somewhere is corrupt or is going corrupt? Well, right now we have to try and 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 sort of build upon what is already there. And already there we have, for example, Transparency International, and then there's Transparency 
uh, in each country. So we should try and use them, but they, what they measure is perception. Perception, and most people in advertisement will tell you that perception sooner or later becomes reality. So I understand that concept, and we have to build upon that. But if I perceive myself as a good person, I think that in the end I probably can end up being a good person, but that doesn't necessarily make me a good person. So although we can use them, um, just don't forget that they're only measuring perception. And what they do is that they give you surveys nationwide to business people. They do try to have very sophisticated ways of sampling. And then they ask you, what do you think your country is like? What do you think your people are like? And that's what the act, and, and according to that perception, that cannot be too far away from reality, but it certainly is not a good snapshot of reality. I have a better suggestion. I have actually two indicators. First, you must take by leaders, by incumbent leaders, you must take a snapshot of everything that you have. Consider the common well being to be an asset. And I give you this asset. When you finish your term, did you give me that asset in the same condition or in better condition? If you gave me the asset back in the same condition, you are an average ruler. If you gave me the asset back in a better condition, you are a superb leader. If you gave it in a worse condition, even if you claim wear and tear, you are actually a corrupt official because you ruined an asset that was in better condition before. That's one measure. The second measurement that I would do it is take a snapshot of the gap between the haves and the have-nots. If during your term that gap closed, you're brilliant. If it remained steady, you're average. If it increased, if you increased the gap between the haves and the have-nots, you were structurally corrupt in your government even though you did not steal a penny. So my two suggestions, let me recapitulate. First, we take a snapshot of what's good and we, we bestow it upon you. Tell me how you give it back when you're finished. Second, what did you do with the trend? Did you have a trend to lower the differences between the haves and the have-nots to at least a factor of 10? If you get to a factor of 10, I'm more than satisfied. Okay, so that, that is that the, the richest is not 10 times richer than the poorest. So if you get to that gap, I'm yeah. more yeah, than satisfied. I, I think, I think 10, 10 times is a very, very optimistic goal. So uh, what yeah, would be satisfactory times, to you? Yeah, you have no complaints there. Okay. Oh, you have no complaints. Okay. I thought I thought you were thinking of a different figure. What would be an acceptable figure? But for oh, me, no, no. I was I was, I was thinking like ten times. That would be amazing if I saw that anywhere. You know, that would be an extremely equal society. So I, that's that's a very good goal to aim to. In some cases, yeah. In some cases, I'm sure um, getting to a hundred times would be a huge milestone. For lots of countries. That would be a shame for me to know which countries have those a hundred times, which is an embarrassment. No, let's look at um the US. I think Jeff Bezos has like a net worth of about a hundred billion dollars. So if the poorest person was worth a billion dollars, that would be <laughs> that would be an amazing country. <laughs> So just looking at that, you know, looking at cases like that. Brilliant example. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I like what you said about measuring, well, not just perception. So you saw the, the questionnaire I did, and that's why I said that was just perception. And I really wanted to know how much they line up with each, with each other, which I guess the answer would be mostly not. But I guess with some caveats, uh, I'll get back to that in a bit. But what you said about measuring the common good or the well-being I guess you would also look at indicators inside there. So I'm thinking, if you look at maybe state assets, like um, now we are oil and gas country, so we could look at the profitability of, you know, the refineries or the oil companies or the gas companies. And if four or five years later or ten years later these companies end up closing down or end up turning much less of a profit then that would be uh, an indicator of bad leadership. That's how it would work. And that we do with health coverage. We do with educational coverage. 
we do with educational scores, although some people have their caveats with measuring education in respect of scores. Uh, we can do that with speed and transport. Suppose, suppose we have right now, uh, we need to build a metro because most commuters commute for an hour. And the modern thing to do is to have a metro. So we build this metro, we spend all this money, and these commute, we spend all this money, and these commuters then commute for 10 minutes. Now that was a marvelous improvement. Suppose we build that same metro, it costs exactly the same metro, and instead of commuting for an hour, now they commute for 58 minutes. What good was that? And we spent all this money. We should have spent that money somewhere else where we've gotten something that we really measured. So public transport should be minute, measured in, in minutes of commuting. What your idea does to improve it. And maybe you should have just had like those, uh, uh, how do you call those, cable carts where they don't pollute and they have an average of about 30 kilometers an hour. That's, uh, that's divided by 5 is 6 times eight, say for like uh, what, 60 is like four, 30 miles, no, 50, 40 miles an hour, I think. It's like 40 miles an hour. You can actually, well, no, no, not 40, that's less. It would be 15 miles an hour that you can commute. They don't pollute. Everybody gets a seat, very cheap to build. Maybe that's what you should have done and not spend all that much money. So it doesn't well, matter well, what. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking something else install a bunch of infrastructure to promote working from home, which is what a lot of companies do now with the outbreak of COVID. So a lot of the people that could work from home, you just cut their commute time to zero minutes. You can't get better than that. And the people that still have to work in the office, well, they have less traffic now. So their commute time also cut down by about half. Now, that's a brilliant example of how we can really actually improve. That's improving the common well-being. And... So if, you, if the government invests in something that reduces people's commuting time to zero, now how, how, how can you top that? I think the hardest part might just be trying to convince somebody that installing infrastructure to allow working from home is actually a transport policy. But if you could convince them of that, who knows? Well, just bring your message in your, in your podcast. You have a good audience. Just sort of fl float the idea that's how the only way we can start and it's not easy for even the most common layman to just reflect on it and yes that reduces your commuting time to zero you can't, you can't get better performance than that uh, okay and what was the other method of um Jesus. you have beautiful cats i have to congratulate you yeah, we think it's good. that's very good <laughs> getting, getting restless, restless so yes, I yes, might yes. have to go and feed them soon mm -hmm. um, right so we're talking about the different methods of measuring corruption so one is well-being the trend to close mm -hmm. the gap between the rich and the poor and you take a snapshot of what assets you have and what assets you give back when your term is over right so this is why I was saying to a very very limited degree sometimes public perception could give you uh, like a faint idea if you're looking at things like unemployment. Because if you have a, an increase, um, if you have increasing unemployment, then you take a survey and you'll have a lot of people saying, well, their standard of, of living dropped, or not even unemployment, but underemployment, where you have people that are working jobs that are below their level of qualifications, which is something we see happening a lot now with, well, computers and automation. So you don't have, you don't need as many mechanics to assemble a car. You know, you might have a mechanical engineer, an electrical engineer, and then 20 factory line workers. But you have five mechanical engineers. So you might have four of them now working as factory line workers, so they're underemployed. So that's what I'm saying is, um, in some cases, the survey might be able to capture, I guess, limited things like standard of living, um, Maybe, well, not unemployment, but well, I guess standard of living is really the main one. And that could kind of give you an idea of what the trend is. 
Yes, so, but you, so would that still be applicable? That would still be applicable, but standard of living, you have to know what you measure. Not everything is GDP, not everything is revenues, not everything is what uh, uh, what is needed for you is not needed for us. Uh, for example, people who live in the Nordic countries with tough winters, they need to have a two-week uh, runaway uh, to warm weathers. That's why they go to the Caribbean, because their winter is just uh, really is tough. So that is a relative issue of what is standard of living and how you measure it is not just an economic indicator and a hard number sometimes you have to look at everything you have some indexes to measure happiness and uh, all these things and and economists are trying to find right now better indicators than just D gdp and uh, ink and basic income and so on but certainly if you make us a measure that generates unemployment before your term there was employment and while in your term you modernize into a bunch of technologies and generated a bunch of unemployment no you're not doing things right there life is a continuum and you must find a way to um as this one this job goes away we can find another place where we can put you because if what you just have is one a new idea where you put all these people to work on this and these other ones just simply uh, are lost as unemployed and, and so be it. No, 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 no. We need to continue. Life continues and you have to take care of your weakest as long as you do not generate dependency on them. That's what quality of social pro programs is all about. Yeah, um, all I could say is thank you so much for taking the taking time. Um, I guess it's because you might have a bit more time now that you're in lockdown. I know a lot of people have a lot more time now. So, but thanks again. I mean, you really shed a light on a lot of issues and a lot of ideas I had about corruption that were just confusing me. Because I, I always thought of corruption as just petty corruption. I never even considered structural corruption and stuff like that. And I think a lot of my viewers might be the same and would also be very thankful. Well, it's been my pleasure. You, you know, taking the time. Thank you for calling on me. If you have any calls, any questions from your audience, please rally them back. You know how to get in touch with me, and it'd be my pleasure. And yes, there is public corruption, uh, public officials being corrupt. There is structural corruption, as you mentioned, and there is private corruption, which is thriving. Thank you. Uh, so there are tons of things that we can do. Uh, to, to fight them as a, as, as a sort of closing thought. The first thing that we can do with private corruption to fight it is to have a whistleblower system that actually protects the whistleblower. Now whistleblowers sometimes are altruists, sometimes they were former members of the corruption ring, so how we handle them, that's another issue. Okay, but we should have one of those, that way we know what they were doing, how they were doing wrong. We need to have a very strong judicial system that actually can prosecute all these people because they usually can have a lot of power. And um, those would be sort of two basic ideas of the bulk things that we can do. The other things that we can do is to try to have always a thriving economy. Our judges, when they rule, they should be concerned on protecting the economy. That's why all those governments that mismanage with lockdowns, they're ruining the economy, and we should be able to challenge that in court. Hmm. And what about what about transparency? So, how important is transparency, and you know, strong fiscal laws? Transparency is very important, but not crucial. The crucial factor that we should have is um, that whenever someone goes astray, the system can correct him and sort of take him out. Just imagine if you were to have an immune deficiency system in the body as an analogy and you were to get any sort of illness that the system would actually correct it. That doesn't mean to say that you are a sick person. It's just that you were temporarily ill and whatever sickness of virus or bacteria that you had, your system cleared it out. That is what is ideal. That is what you should have. So whenever there is any ruler that knows that he can get away with anything because his party is going to protect him, 
that would be when the system is to completely ruin this, like, as if you were to get a common cold and you would die. When you were immune, your immune system were to be lowered and you don't have a good protection system, so any little thing would take you away, that's the worst kind that you should have. That's the worst form of corruption is that when the system cannot clear itself out. Suppose you were to have a police system and, I don't know, 1% of the people were corrupt. There's no problem with that. Even there's no problem if 10% of the police officers were corrupt. Yeah, as long as they've been cleaned out. Correct, as long as you could clear them out. You can take them, you can charge them, you could prosecute them, you give them a right to a defense, and if they're found guilty, they're out. There's no problem with that. People will make mistakes. We all make mistakes. But if you make a mistake and the system makes you get away with it, that is the worst form of corruption. But if the system finds you guilty and takes you out, it's working just fine and the system is good. Just one bad apple here and there that we need to take out of the basket. All right. Well, once again, thank you so much. And we'll keep in touch. Very well. My Adios. pleasure. Okay. Best regards you to your safe. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.